Has Ethiopia's Tigray People's Liberation Front been crushed by Prime Minister Abe Ahmed's crackdown in the region? I'll ask a senior member of the group. I'm Mark Lamont Hill. Also on the show, yet another spate of mass shootings in the United States, and along with it, another debate about gun control. But is this time different? Will President Joe Biden be the one to finally implement reform? We'll speak with a mass shooting survivor turned activist. But first, horrifying accounts of human rights abuses continue to emerge from Ethiopia's northern Tigray region, where the government is at war with the Tigray People's Liberation Front, the TPLF. Is there any end in sight? And what is the TPLF's objective? This week's headliner from Tigray, TPLF spokesperson Katachu Retta. Since last November, more than two million people have been displaced by the conflict between Ethiopia's government and the Tigray People's Liberation Front, the TPLF. Thousands have been killed, and credible reports have emerged of massacres and widespread sexual violence. The United Nations has called for an immediate end to attacks on civilians, but with rights groups still unable to gain full access to the Tigray region, it remains unclear just how bad things are. We invited the Ethiopian government to come on our program to discuss the situation, but they refused our request, saying they did not want to share a platform with the TPLF, a group they view as, quote, a criminal enterprise. We are joined now by Katachu Retta, a spokesperson and executive committee member of the TPLF. Katachu, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. You're joining us on Upfront from an undisclosed location via telephone uh, from the Tigray region. Oh, why? Well, uh, we're in a war zone. Like you said, uh, since last November, the 4th of November, uh, Ali Ahmed's uh, illegitimate government and uh, his partners in crime, uh, more particularly the entire regime in Asmara, uh, have been launching uh, a coordinated attack against the people of Tigray. Uh, now we are in a war zone where uh, the people of Tigray and the uh, Tigray army have been uh, waging a successful resistance against uh, this coordinated attack. Uh, by uh, Abiy Ahmed, Isaiah Saforki, and his, his partners in crime. They are partners in crime. And it is uh, quite obvious that uh, it would be foolhardy for us to disclose where, where I am. Of course, I'm uh, part of the resistance, and uh, I am with, with, with uh, the Tigran army. Uh, and uh, like I said, we are waging an effective resistance, and we've been successful in, in checkmaking the uh, genocidal campaign by, by Abiy Ahmed and Isaiah Saporki and their partners in crime. Uh, for months, Prime Minister uh, Abiy Ahmed has denied the presence of Eritrean troops in the Tigray region. Uh, despite reports from the United Nations of human rights abuses by Eritrea in the region, last week he finally admitted that Ethiopian national forces and Eritrean soldiers had been fighting uh, side by side. He also announced on Twitter that the Eritrean government agreed to withdraw its forces and that the Ethiopian National Defense Force would take over guarding the border, quote, immediately. Uh, have Eritrean forces left? No, they haven't left. In fact, there is no intention on the part of the Eritrean region to withdraw its forces. Despite the protestation uh, that uh, Eritrean forces had not been involved in the fighting, Abiy had to come forward and admit that uh, it was, in fact, true that Eritrean forces were fighting alongside with uh, his forces in Tigray. Now, uh, when the international community tightened the screw uh, on the issue of the Eritrean government, uh, Abiy had to come forward and say uh, the Eritrean government has agreed to withdraw its forces. But no, none of us has heard from the Eritrean government whether there was uh, an intention on the part of the Eritrean government to withdraw their forces. In fact, since the announcement of uh, Abiy's tweet about uh, Isaiah's agreement to withdraw its forces, Eritrea has been uh, increasing the influx of its forces into Tigray by leaps and bounds. But as far as Isaias and Ali are concerned, uh, withdrawal of their forces uh, from the point of view of their survival is uh, quite unthinkable because Ali uh, has already lost 
tens of thousands of Ethiopian forces. Uh, most of them are being used in cannon fodder. So if I can can uh, can have uh, can use Ethiopian forces as cannon fodder, but uh, apparently Ethiopia is tasked with hunting down the real leaders. Unfortunately for them. The very people who are in the business of hunting us down are being hunted down right now. I wanted to ask you a question uh, about, about a comment that you made in December uh, of last year. During an interview with Tigray TV, you called upon the people in the region to, quote, uh, rise and deploy to battle in tens of thousands. Uh, given that the Tigray opposition reports that tens of thousands of people are now dead, and there have been numerous documented human rights abuses. Do you regret the statement? Should you have worked harder uh, to create diplomatic possibilities in the international uh, community to get international support rather than rising up in the way that they did? Well, I would be naive to assume that uh, coordinating with Ali Ahmed and Isaiah Safosi would have yielded different results than it has already. Uh, because uh, when in 2018 Ali Ahmed and uh, Isaiah Safosi inked the deal, it was specifically meant to neutralize TPLF uh, because TPLF were considered as the only obstacle that stood between uh, their uh, original ambitions. So whatever we might have done would not have, uh, would not have averted facts. But yes, we could have done more diplomatically in the sense that we could have brought more attention to the evil principle that was uh, obviously at work. And uh, it is regrettable. That people who should have been the business of protecting civilians, people like Ali Ahmed, who has been touted as a reformer by the West, was from the beginning in, in uh, beating the people of Tigray into submission. And nothing could have stopped that, uh, short of, of course, uh, an effective resistance with the people of Tigray. So, do I regret calling all the people of uh, Tigray to, 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 to come to by their uh, thousands? No, I don't regret it. I regret the fact that we could have. It, it, it's, it's a bit stunning. I mean, there, there, so there was a, a senior humanitarian official in, in Tigray who said that this could end up uh, like a situation similar to uh, Yugoslavia, where we'll be digging up mass graves for more than a decade. Uh, when I look at that amount of, um, of, of violence, when I look at that amount of death, uh, it prompts the question, uh, was there room, despite the circumstances you've just laid out, was there room for some alternative? Not maybe not ultimately, uh, no violence, but certainly at least in the short term, some diplomatic possibility, some international coalition that could have led to an outcome that was different. Is there anything you could have done differently? Well, look, uh, it, it would require uh, uh, a wizard of sorts to to to, to uh, dream up a situation where Ali and Isaiah could have been persuaded. Uh, against against uh, the kind of bloody intervention they went ahead for, but the international community should have and would have done could have done uh, uh, better uh, in terms of raising Abi in. Uh, is there currently any line of communication uh, between the TPLF and the Abe government? No, no, not none at all. Only through the battle of gun, as it were. What is the end game here? Does the TPLF want to grab to become its own state? Is that the ultimate uh, goal here? Uh, you know, I, I can address this question only by giving you my take on what it means to be an Ethiopian. You know, within the TPLF, I, I have been one of the staunchest proponents of uh, a strong Ethiopian state. I have no clue whatsoever how this very notion of strong Ethiopian state could be solved to an individual figure right now who's been, who's been finding himself and his people at the receiving end of Ethiopia's genocidal adventure. Now, it would be absolutely impossible for a staunch opponent, of a proponent of Ethiopian state like myself to come out in public and uh, argue for the continuity of Ethiopian state. I'm not saying Ethiopia should go down the drain, but I have no capacity whatsoever to avoid uh, to avoid that kind of, that kind of decision by the uh, by the people of the ground. So I, I would rather say at this point that it should be left for the people of the ground to determine whether if they should die, they should have their own state. I would strongly strongly suggest 
that uh, this is probably the best option there is at this point in time. It would be very foolhardy for me to, to come out in public and probably uh, say tons of uh, good things about Ethiopian state when what we have seen uh, the last five months uh, makes it abundantly clear that there is little that is left uh, for any uh, ordinary Tigrans. Kitesha, if I'm understanding you correctly, uh, you're saying that you're not ruling this out. You're not ruling out the possibility of an independent state. I'm not ruling it out. In fact, uh, the situation strongly suggests that that would probably be uh, the most viable option. Is the possibility of a state a realistic one, though? Uh, because no, 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 if no, it no, happens... What? No, you're, no, you're, you're landlocked between Sudan, Eritrea, Ethiopia. I was just, I was just curious. I, I understand you're not calling for I'm, one per I'm se not, today, I, look, but you're not I mean, ruling out the possibility. I guess what I, I'm, I'm not ruling out. By the way, as far as I'm concerned, statehood is not just about having being landlocked or uh, whatever. Statehood is about aspirations of people. And when if the people of Tigray aspire to become an independent state, there is nothing, nothing whatsoever that could stand in the way uh, of that, that aspiration. That, that's the bottom line. My, my issue is, like I told you, I, 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 I was one of the strongest proponents of, of uh, a strong Ethiopian, a federal Ethiopian state. But even myself, a strong proponent of Ethiopian state, will have difficulty coming out in public and supporting the Ethiopian project. I don't think it is a viable option at this point in time. What I'm saying is, I'm not entirely ruling out the possibility of Ethiopia rising from the ISIS, but it is more idealistic, more romantic. Kitachi Reda, thank you so much for joining me on Up Front. My pleasure. Two mass shootings in the space of just one week have reignited the debate about gun control in the United States. On March 16th, eight people were killed in a shooting spree in Atlanta, Georgia. Just days later, 10 people were killed in another shooting at a grocery store in Boulder, Colorado. President Joe Biden was quick to call for a ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines, urging members of Congress to take action. But since the shootings, his focus has already shifted to other areas of policy. So after years of inaction on meaningful reforms to prevent mass shootings in the United States, is it just going to be more of the same? To help us answer this, we're joined by Cameron Caskey, a gun rights activist and a survivor of the 2018 school shooting in Parkland, Florida, which killed 17 of his fellow students and teachers. Cameron, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. We're at another one of these moments that we've seen far too often in the United States. We have a spate of mass shootings that have caused people to say we need to do something about gun legislation. A day after the shooting in Boulder, President Biden said, and I quote, he didn't need to wait another minute to address gun control. And yet since then, he's shifted back to talking about infrastructure as the priority issue. What do you make of this shift? Are, are you worried that serious action will never happen on gun control? It's bizarre. I'm starting to see something with the Biden administration that I saw and I, everybody saw a lot of with the Trump administration, which is the people in power taking this bizarre stance where they're acting as though they are not completely in power. Donald Trump, when he was the president, would constantly tweet, oh, Washington politics are so corrupt. Everybody out there in Washington, they aren't looking, they aren't looking out for you. When he was the president of the United States and he had a lot of control with the Senate, so right now, the Biden administration is using people like Joe Manchin and, and Kirsten Sinema as this kind of safety net, where if there's policy that they are not particularly interested in trying too hard to pass, they get to say, oh, well, you know what, it's not going to get the votes in the Senate, and there's only so much we can do, as if the Democrats don't literally have every branch right now. So the question becomes, if they're not going to show up for immensely popular things like background checks and red flag laws, which, you know, 70, more than 70 percent of card-holding NRA members support red flag laws. What are Biden and Harris going to show up for? It wasn't the $15 minimum wage. It wasn't uh, canceling student loan debt. You know, we've seen a lot of great things, and the American Rescue Plan was uh, in many ways a success. But, you know, if you're not going to deliver on guns, I spent. The, I've spent the well, past Cameron, three. Cameron, though, let, let me ask you. I mean, are you are you surprised by this? I mean, we've seen presidency after presidency show the same kind of lack of political will 
on the question of gun legislation. So there can't be too much of a surprise here. No, I mean, look, at the end of the day, uh, specifically background checks and red flag laws, those laws are so unbelievably popular that it's shocking to me that those won't pass. But in terms of a ban on assault rifles and other, you know, what I consider common sense pieces of gun reform, I'm not surprised at all. And it's been a common thread with the Biden-Harris administration that we're not seeing exactly what we wanted out of them. But I I've spent three years telling everybody, guys, we need to get the Democrats in power because once the Democrats are in power, we're going to be able to fix these kinds of issues. And, you know, here a lot of people are in the gun violence prevention community. We're sitting here saying, OK, this is the moment. Are we not going to get it? Yeah, I mean, it, Biden didn't just gesture toward this. He gave some concrete promises, some day one uh, promises, including sending a bill to Congress uh, to repeal liability protection for gun manufacturers and, of course, closing the loopholes in the federal background uh, check system. Now, there will be people who say, look, Biden is playing the long game here. He has to navigate a, a Congress that is, has a razor-thin majority for Democrats, and many of those Democrats who you referenced are themselves right-leaning, and that there really isn't much else they can do. Do you take that? Do you, do you understand that sensibility, or you are like, a promise is a promise, a day one promise has to be kept? Well, I get it. Politics are real. But again, <laughs> the question is, at what point are we going to get something meaningful from them? Because if you've got the governing power, you have to govern. That's just how it works. And how silly are we going to look in 2022 when we're asking America to vote for Democrats again, and America says, OK, well, um, the Democrats campaigned very distinctly on these issues and wouldn't even deliver the most baseline, simple results on them, right? I mean, if we put in four years of what we've been seeing in the first less than 100 days of the Biden administration, which the first 100 days are normally when you see so many of the results, what, what am I supposed to tell people? What is anybody supposed to tell anybody when we're trying to get them to vote for Democrats in 2022? You know, that we're asking to lose seats if we're not going to deliver the things that we said we did. Some would argue that the result of these mass shootings are evidence that we won't get anywhere. Think about the Sandy Hook uh, school shooting, for example, in 2012. You have 20 people, 20 young people ages six and seven, they, they die, and we don't see any shift in gun legislation, no progress in the estimation of many. That moment, for so many observers, was the moment where they realized or believed, came to believe, that nothing was ever going to change, that if that many children killed did nothing, then there's no shooting, no tragedy, no other moment that could sway uh, lawmakers any more than that one. What do you make of that idea? Well, look, Sandy Hook was a huge sign. It was a sign that, you're right, this is not going to happen because of one of these shootings. White little kids are the only thing Republicans like to talk about with any legislation. They like to tell you in their culture war battles that the liberals are coming to do this to your kids. And obviously, they don't care when children of color are murdered. So when that many white children were murdered, and we still didn't see any any meaningful legislation pass, that was a sign, no matter what levels of cruelty we will see, it's, it's not just going to happen like that. And that's why so many people in the gun violence prevention community were thrilled to see that Joe Biden won the election, because we said, OK, we've got Biden and Harris, Biden and Harris, who campaigned on these changes. These aren't changes that we made up out of nowhere. You know. Things like red flag laws, universal background checks, that's the most basic technocratic thing that I could have written out and told you about in fourth grade. And we're, if we're not going to get these, you know, why are we going to the ballots in 2022? Why am I supposed to go? I, I will, and I'll campaign for the Democrats because that's just my life. <laughs> but what are we supposed to say to people who see this kind of violence with no meaningful actions? One of the things... Uh, that the NRA does and other gun, con gun uh, advocates do is they appeal to the Second Amendment. They create a kind of romantic narrative of the Second Amendment and how it's tied to liberty and freedom, et cetera, that the right to bear arms, the right to own weapons is tied to our sense of citizenship and identity as Americans. When I watch people on your side of the fence 
uh, defend your position, you often still appeal to the Second Amendment. Rather than say the Second Amendment is something we should get rid of, I often hear you say, look, we're not trying to take your guns, we're just trying to uh, control reasonably what people have access to and how people navigate so we can be more safe. My question for you is, why, why stop there? Why, why concede the ground that the Second Amendment is a reasonable place to start, given the context in which it was produced? Why begin from a place of saying that every American uh, adult has a right to have a weapon? Why begin there? Why not begin by questioning the premise itself that the Second Amendment may not be a reasonable uh, uh, constitutional provision in the 21st century? Sure. Well, um, I need to very quickly make it clear that my personal views on this are not reflective of the entire gun safety community. It's my understanding that the entire gun safety community is very rooted in upholding the Second Amendment, but upholding the Second Amendment in its appropriate use. Um, and, and by that, I mean allowing people to hold their right to bear arms, but arguing that uh, this is not a well-trained militia that we're seeing, right? well-regulated militia. We don't have a well-regulated militia here. We don't even know how to put on masks when we go to Walmart. <laughs> My personal opinion is that um, our country's obsession with the Constitution is very weird. It's a very, very old document. There's some good stuff in it. There's some very silly stuff in it. But it was written by literal slave owners. And look, I don't want to trigger people because people get really upset when young people are talking smack on the Constitution. People have this really weird obsession with it when— they won't even follow the Constitution uh, when it isn't appropriate for them, you know. But, um, you know, I think that there's two ways to look at it. Yes, banning these assault weapons can be adjacent to the Second Amendment, simply because the Second Amendment was not written with the understanding that weapons of this power would exist, and we well, don't let, have... Let me a ask a simpler question. If you were in charge of policy for the United States, would, we, would you still... Uh, allow for the Second Amendment to exist? Would you allow for all Americans to have a right to bear any arms? Well, I, don't, I wouldn't say all Americans. I think that Americans should have the right to um, defend themselves and their homes specifically with weapons. I think that the working class should have the right to be armed with weapons that belong in the hands of civilians and are not directly designed for killing. I think that well, people so when, you color... say, when you say weapons, are you, are you, you mean guns? Yeah. I mean, look, we have handguns in my house. My father has a gun safely stored in a locked safe. I couldn't tell you where the key is in case um, he needs to defend our home. I don't know how to access the gun that we have, but people should have the right to own a handgun, in my opinion, specifically people in communities of color that are the targets of racial violence. I feel as though suggesting that people should disarm themselves when they are directly threatened by police officers would be very short-sighted of me. I'm not directly afraid of police officers the way that people of color would be, uh, because I feel as though the police force in this country is designed to work and protect and serve I gotta me. Push a, I got to push a little bit on that, Cameron. I got to push a little bit on that, because some people would say, myself included, quite frankly, that, that that's leaning into the, the well-regulated militia argument, that it's like this romantic idea that somehow handguns are going to protect the vulnerable in this country from, from state violence. In other words, black people in this country can't defend themselves from the police with guns, right? Well, that's where it gets really complicated, because on the one hand, you know, there are people, there are conservatives who will say, you can't, uh, you know, run over the Second Amendment rights of people in black communities. Look what's, look what's happening. You know, and it's like, okay, conservatives, you have absolutely no right to be sp speaking about this. But it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing to bring up. I think that if um, a black person is stopped by a police officer and they are legally carrying a handgun, that can be an excuse that the police officer seizes to do whatever horrible things that they want, because a police officer will say that a black person having a pack of Skittles is a weapon. So you've got this really difficult situation, obviously, specifically for communities of color, where on the one hand, self-defense is important. On the other hand, if you have a, if you have a pack of sticky notes in your pocket, the cops will shoot you dead and say that it's, oh, I thought it was a gun. And I don't have an easy answer to that. I will say that I think that the right to own a gun should be protected, and that should be protected. But it, it, all of this, 
all of this can just be put aside to, to look at the issue of assault rifles, where nobody really needs these weapons. Cameron Kasky, thank you so much for joining me on Upfront. Thanks so much. All right. That is our show for the week, but Upfront will be back next week.